So, first off, hello, my name's Dexter and I work for Due Research. We are Europe's leading quantitative finance research firm. And every day we deal with a lot of data and for a lot of it, time is a fairly key component. Like this data arrives at various time periods or with time in it or with respect to other things. So it's very important to keep track of all of the times that are relevant. So today I'm gonna to be taking you through, first of all, why we need to worry about time in this sort of data in the first place. Then we're going to look at how we actually go about modeling time in a graph database, because it's a little bit interesting. Uh, then we're going to look at how we start to work in multiple time dimensions. And then we're just going to finish off with a quick look at some of the things you need to keep an eye out for if you're experimenting with this sort of stuff. So first off, well, I'd probably lose my brick card if I didn't use T as an example, right? So uh, we're, we're going to use T. So the example I'm going to be using today is basically my ability to gift people tea and the success that I've had. So, I mean, I think we should just take a look at the graph before we, uh, we go any further. So here is an example graph that I've got. It's a very simple one just for the purposes of this talk. As we can see, we've got orange nodes which represent the teas, pink or purpley nodes that sort of represent the people, and we've got these blue nodes that represent my attempt to gift a tea to someone. So in this case, we're modeling me gifting two teas to Maria. The first tea that I've gifted was Lady Grey, which as you can see is similar to her favorite tea, and it was well received, reasonably well received at least. And I've given her the second tea, which is marked as her actual favorite, but, 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 it, but it didn't go so well. Well, why, why, why might that be? Well, the answer is simple, of course. She's just changed her mind. People's tea choices evolve over time. Back in the day, she liked Yorkshire tea the best. As for most of the time I've known her, she likes Earl Grey. But now she's moved on and she likes Sakura Sencha instead. Okay, that's fair enough. People's choices do change with time, so we clearly need to actually model not just the current state, but also any states that have changed, because otherwise we'd lose information. We could just update our graph and just say, okay, her favorite is now Sakura Sencha, but then we'd lose information, and losing information isn't great. So instead, what we're going to do is we're just going to add both to the graph. And to do that, we need to think about how we're going to model time in the first place. So there's a couple of options here. First is what I'm calling JBot, just a bunch of timestamps. Very simple conceptually. You just stick timestamps on everything that you want to version. It really is that easy. Querying can be a little complicated, but it's not particularly hard. It's quite a nice system, and we're going to be looking at that in more detail in a bit. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about time trees briefly. This is a really interesting way of modeling time, specifically in graph databases, because it allows us to model time itself as a graph. And this is interesting, because it means that when we're querying it, we don't have to do uh, date maths or anything like that. We can actually just traverse the graph of time to find stuff out. So let's take a look at an example. This is a time tree, a relatively simple one, so that it fits on one slide. Um, you start with a root node at the top, and then at each layer of the tree, you get more and more granular. So here I've got years, months, and days. So we can see here there's sort of four relevant months, and then some, uh, sorry, four relevant years, several months, several days, etc. This could go deeper if you wanted it to. It could go, you know, hours, seconds, nanoseconds, it doesn't really matter. There's also a couple of helper references around the place. So you'll see that there's a first time child and a last time child. That allows you to very quickly move around the graph. So you don't have to do that sort of thing where you go, oh, now what's the last day of the month again? I I'm not sure. You just go to the appropriate month and follow the last node. It's that simple. If you want to know what the next day is, you just follow the next link. Now this brings up an interesting question. I said what the next day is. But here we've got going from one to six. Well, that's not one day. That's because this is a sparse time tree. And by sparse, what I mean is we're only modeling times that have relevance. So if there's some data that happens at a time, say, you know, on the 1st of January 2010, we make a node over here, we link it to this, great. And then if there's no data that's relevant until the 1st of June, that's fine, that's all we have to model. This is great because it means our tree can be much bigger while not actually being particularly complicated which is quite nice. It also means that when we're moving through the graph, we don't have to work out what's next. If you've ever written any sort of SQL query to say, I want the one that's after this one, but, you know, before, oh, uh, yeah. No, it gets a bit complicated, but you don't have to do that. You just go next, and you find the next one. It's nice. The downside is that now we've lost some of that nice ability that you might have thought of for just going, what's the next day? 
If you want to write a query that's something that happened in the last three days, you can't just follow the link three times. You have to sort of follow each link and go, oh, well, has it been more than three days? So this gets a bit complicated. And obviously, if you've done a dense time tree, which means you've actually filled out every single one of these, if you've gone down to nanoseconds, it's going to be a very big tree. But it allows you to write those queries in a structural form, which is quite nice. Also, there's a really nice thing you can do around grouping here, because not only can you just find the first and last days of months, but say you wanted to know everything that happened in 2010, easy. Start on the 2010 node and just traverse. That's it. You found everything in 2010. It's really nice. But it's quite complicated, and it does increase the, the complexity of your queries quite a bit. Depending on the type of graph database you're using, this may be more or less relevant. Uh, for some graph databases, each one of these traversals is essentially a join. So doing this a lot of times, maybe not ideal. So for our examples, we're just going to use JBot. So let's go back to the graph and see how that looks. Great. I've put some dates on things. And really, I should have put dates on everything. But you don't have to timestamp everything if things don't necessarily have uh, you know, time as a component. But it can make your life a little bit easier. So now, all I've done here is I've added a start and an end time to all of the relevant relationships. So we can see here that what happened is Maria started liking Yorkshire tea, then she switched in 2019 to prefer Earl Grey, then she switched again in 2020 to prefer Sakura Sencha. Great. I gave that first gift when she still liked uh, Earl, Earl Grey the best. So Lady Grey was a good gift. But when I gave her this gift, she'd already changed preference. So, oh, well, I mean, that explains that, eh? So let's look at how we might actually use this in terms of code. Most of the time, you're only going to be wanting to look at one view, probably the latest. And in this model, this is quite simple. All you do is just look for a case where the relationship is just null. If, if there's no end date on the relationship, then it's still the active one. It's that simple. You can also take this a little bit further. And what we're doing here is saying, well, all right, what was Maria's favorite tea at the time of the various events that I've got here? So I, there we have two gifting events. And I'm saying, find me the favorite at that relevant time using this start and end that we've got. Great. Now I've got this lovely little table that tells me 0.6 success rate, I gave her a black tea, she liked black tea. 0.3 success rate, I gave her a black tea, she preferred green. Well, there we go. We've got our answer. This is a great model, and it allows us to get some inferences from the graph. But of course, there's a problem here. If you gave that to a data scientist, the data scientist would probably say, well, you're terrible at gifting. But it, it wasn't that I was bad at gifting. It was just that she changed preferences and I didn't know. So the data scientist has come up with an incorrect insight about this data because we've lost that information that I only gained the information about the past after some time that was relevant. So this is what we call look ahead. And it's a really important problem in the sort of industry that we're in. When you're trying to predict the future of markets, you often want to test against what's already happened, how things might perform in the future, how things have performed in the past. And if you can see the future, you get incorrect insights. You might well write something that can perform really well, but in the reality of dirty or old or outdated data, it performs terribly. So to solve this problem of look ahead, which is essentially just we have different views of the timeline, what we need to do is actually timestamp the timeline and start thinking about time in multiple dimensions. There's a couple of ways to do this. The simplest is just snapshot your graph every now and then. The other two are a little bit more complicated, so let's just cover the first one and get it out of the way. It's very simple. You just take a copy anytime anything changes. If you have very slow moving data, this can be quite relevant. And it's very easy to just write your queries, because your queries don't have to change at all. You just look at the appropriate snapshot, jobs are good. And there's the issue of querying cross snapshots, though. And how frequently do you snapshot? And how much space is this going to take? It, it's not really practical for most use cases. So let's look at the other options. This is the one that we've ended up using most. And it's very simple. Let's just add more timestamps. More timestamps, more better. It's that simple. We previously had two timestamps, which helped us model a single time axis. So if we want to model multiple or n temporal time, all we need is n sets of start and end to model those various views of time. This can be quite easy to query, because it's quite index friendly, which is quite nice. But it, it does make things a little bit more complicated. So let's just look at some code. This is that same query as before, but now I've got an extra relationship there, which allows me to determine the favorite not just now, but the favorite at the time. And then I've got a restriction down here using my new known and until, known being when I found out 
about the fact that something started and ended on some date, and until being when that stopped being true and was superseded by something else. So now we have a much better version of this table, which actually allows us to get the insights we want, because now we can see, yes, I gave her a black tea when her favorite was green, but the best thing I knew at the time was black. So the inference that we should have got from that isn't that I'm terrible at giving people tea, it's that I should really update my preferences more. I should probably just ask people what they like before I buy them teas. We can make this query a bit simpler because you don't actually need to write that whole thing every time. What you can do is define your query, no matter how complex or simple it is, and then apply these sorts of general uh, conditions over the whole thing. So in this case, we're saying for all nodes in the path that we've matched, assert that either it's atemporal data or that it's within whatever time ranges we want to test for. And the same thing for the relationships. This makes things quite easy. And of course, you can even just parameterize it so that this can be entirely consistent and you can copy paste it around or put it into a stored procedure maybe. If we're using something like a Tinkerpop graph, it actually gets even nicer because we can use things like multi-properties and meta-properties. A multi-property is just a property that can have multiple values. So here I've said, well, my name, I have a nickname as well. So let's put some meta-properties on the property of my nickname and say when I started having that nickname and when I first knew about it, because chances are my parents were calling me Dex long before I actually was sentient enough to realize. So this makes things quite nice. And if we go back to the idea of abstracting this a little bit, we can actually do really think really nice things in this situation because Tinkerpop graphs have this interesting concept of a traversal strategy. There's a few built in, but you can make your own very easily. And this is essentially that same code that we had in Cypher a minute ago, but now in Gremlin. But we're saying here, rather than on the individual query, we have a strategy where we check every vertex and every edge. And then all you have to do to use this is just say with strategies, give it your viewpoint of time, jobs are good, and it's that simple. So if you want to deal with you know, bitemporal, tritemporal, whatever time, all you have to do is write an appropriate traversal strategy and tell people to use it. That's pretty nice. Finally, I just want to have a quick look at the entity state model. This one's a little bit more complicated. A lot of what we've looked at so far is relatively easy for humans to understand. And I've cheated a little bit in the demonstrations by putting as much of the information as possible in relationships which makes things a bit easier for us humans to see. Because if you have a node where there's 10 copies of me, it's, it's actually a little bit hard for a human to really understand what that means. And it gives you super nodes fairly quickly. So this is a bit more of a general solution, but it is often overcomplicated for a lot of use cases. So I just want to look at it briefly. So let's just have a look at the graph. The idea here is that we separate the concept of an entity from its state. So in this case, we have entities like me and Maria, and we are static. We only have immutable data associated with us like our name. Now, admittedly, that probably shouldn't be immutable, but hey, I wanted to make this easy to read. And then each one of these has a state associated with it. And just like that time tree before, we have extra helper things. So we have the current one, which allows us to just jump around to see just the current view very easily. Now, in this case, I've got the uh, Maria's state changes over time as she gains new favorites. That creates a favorite, which has a state. And then whenever I learn about that favorite, my state changes. This adds a relationship. So what this is doing is versioning the relationships themselves. Any individual state of mine at some point in time tells you what I knew at the time just by following those relationships. It's a little bit harder for a human to parse. I've even hidden some of the nodes here to make it a little bit easier for us to read. But it works quite nicely for this sort of model. It does, however, mean that you have to copy the nodes around every time you want to make a change to any of that state. This is quite time consuming and complicated, so do consider using a library like the Neo4j version of Core, which is linked at the bottom. Their documentation is quite good, and I'd recommend reading it if you want to go down this route. So very quickly, let's just have a quick look at the pitfalls that you might run into. As we've already sort of mentioned as we've been going past here, this can result in your graph getting quite big. Because as soon as you have to multiplex things, as soon as you have to deal with multiple time axes, you're going to have to duplicate something. If you've gone with the meta property approach, you can end up with really large nodes that can be impractical to work with. If you've gone with the approach of just having lots of timestamps, if you start getting into seven, eight dimensions, it starts being a bit a bit chunky. And if you start to have to look at how many of those things change, then you're going to have to have potentially eight, nine copies of the same relationship, which is going to make super nodes very quickly. That's part of what that previous thing does, where by putting all the relationships in an R node, you can be careful not to traverse them out and have super node issues. You can also just make your queries complicated and in general, just make your life a little bit hard. 
it's important to keep in mind what you need to do to make things worthwhile for you and to make sure that you have enough timestamps on things as you capture the data. It's very easy to sort of just write a traversal strategy to ignore a specific time axis, but it's very, very difficult to fill it out after the fact. That's all I have time for, and if you've got any questions, do feel free to come and find me. <laughs>